The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Expert Perspectives on Novel Targeted Therapies for Sjogren's Disease, Hope is on the Horizon. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash HPW 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. I am very pleased to present the program entitled Expert Perspectives on Novel Targeted Therapies for Sjogren's Disease, Hope is on the Horizon. I'm Steve Carsons, and I'm joined uh, by my colleague, Dr. Nancy Carteron, uh, from the University of California at Berkeley in San Francisco, and especially grateful uh, to be joined by one of my patients, Ms. Mary Lou Carraher, who will describe her journey uh, with Sjogren's disease. We'll start with a discussion of patient unmet needs and quality of life issues. Sjogren's disease is nearly as common as rheumatoid arthritis, having a prevalence rate between 0.6 and 1%. It should be noted that dryness or sicka symptoms are about three times as prevalent in the general population. But Sjogren's disease is a chronic autoimmune inflammatory disease characterized by oral and ocular dryness leading to end organ damage. It often co-occurs with other autoimmune diseases, especially the connective tissue diseases, RA and lupus. And various reports indicate that extraglandular manifestations occur anywhere between 15 and 80%, depending on the patient population and duration of disease. These most commonly manifest as an inflammatory arthropathy, lung disease, neuropathy, vasculitis, renal tubular acidosis, and fatigue. Importantly, there is an increased risk of developing B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in Sjogren's disease, which has been estimated to be approximately 18-fold that of the unaffected population. Considering the diagnosis of Sjogren's disease, clinicians should consider other autoimmune disorders, particularly IgG4-related systemic disease, viral infections such as hepatitis C, and malignancy such as isolated salivary gland lymphoma. Of note have been several recent biologic trials directed toward the therapy of Sjogren's disease. However, currently there are no specific approved therapies, but these are on the horizon. A couple of notes regarding changes in terminology. Currently, Sjogren's disease is preferred to the older Sjogren's syndrome, since we now know it is a well-characterized autoimmune disease. Likewise, rather than using the older terms primary and secondary Sjogren's, the preferred terminology is Sjogren's with or without associated disease or Sjogren's overlap. My colleague, Dr. Carteron, is now going to describe some of the ordinal clinical manifestations of Sjogren's disease. So one of the key findings um, in Sjogren's is the dryness, um, particularly in the mouth. Uh, it can be characterized uh, by patients as a parched mouth. Um, the ACR slide to the right shows um, the erythematous uh, picture uh, that occurs, uh, and this can be accompanied uh, by uh, candidiasis without the typical uh, white patches. Uh, these features um, contribu contribute to an accelerated rate of dental decay, which is a major problem uh, in quality of life for patients as well as in cost. Another key feature um, of the uh, head, neck, and oral manifestations in Sjogren's is a parotid swelling. And again, um, with an ACR slide, 
Uh, we see pictorially the unilateral um, or can be bilateral parotid swelling, which occurs in about 50% of patients, so not all patients with Sjogren's will have this. The salivary gland involvement can also be uh, affected by duct blockage with stones and with infections. And a key recommendation from the Sjogren's Foundation clinical practice guidelines uh, for oral manifestations uh, is that uh, for all physicians to consider prescribing and getting patients started on uh, topical fluoride um, twice a day, which is a prescription for dental prevention. The next slide uh, shows us the key manifestations of eye involvement uh, with Sjogren's. From a patient's perspective, they describe it as um, not only foreign body, but dry, gritty, uh, sometimes awakening in the morning with the eyelids being stuck together. Other features that can occur are of thick mucus threads, light sensitivity, uh, and fatigue, ocular fatigue, and actual vision um, manifestations on top of blurry vision, in addition to blurry vision, but also um, in overall uh, ability to uh, read. A, a common uh, sensitive finding uh, for Sjogren's, more sensitive than the patient's description, is that of the uh, Schirmer's test which is um, shown on the uh, upper uh, pictorial. Um, however, uh, a formal ocular staining score, which um, uh, has been validated, is not only more specific, but even more sensitive in picking up early manifestations of uh, dry eye that occurs in Sjogren's um, and uh, has been uh, validated, as we'll hear about uh, further in uh, classification criteria. But overall, the most serious complication is that of uh, ocular infection and vision loss. So Dr. Carsons will uh, highlight the important um, role that epithelial cells play in the pathogenesis of Sjogren's. Thanks. It's important to recognize that in addition to the classical dry eye, dry mouth symptoms of Sjogren's disease, there is more generalized epithelial tissue involvement. Dr. Harry Metsopoulos uh, raised the issue many years ago of autoimmune epitheliitis. Uh, which would be an inflammation of all epithelial-based glands and tissue. So therefore, as indicated on the diagram and on the uh, blue box to the right, uh, Sjogren's disease can involve immune cell infiltration and inflammation of the lung, the kidneys, particularly the tubules, the GI tract, the female genital tract, and the skin. This is a picture showing uh, dry skin, uh, which has this uh, dry cracked appearance and can lead to discomfort and quality of life issues from, from pruritus and excess excoriation. The genital dryness can lead commonly to superficial infections and dyspareunia. And the nasotracheal bronchial dryness can cause chronic cough, which is estimated to occur in approximately 40%, uh, bloody nose, nasal congestion, and crusting. We are now grateful uh, to have the comments of Mary Lou Carraher regarding her experience with the diagnosis and management of Sjogren's disease. Back in 1992, I went to my primary physician for a visit because I was having tingling in my toes and in my tongue. I know that's a very strange symptom. And he did a physical and basically said, you know, kind of patted me on the head and said, everything looks fine. So it continued and I went back to him and he did some more blood work and he said my sedimentation rate was up, which is an indicator of inflammation. 
and he sent me to a rheumatologist. At that time, we didn't have very sophisticated laboratory tests like we have today. And he did a number of tests, and he said, you know, you're a pretty healthy 40-something-year-old woman. And he said, um, someday you may develop an autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis or Sjogren's, or he mentioned some others. Well, I already had an autoimmune disease at that point. I had Hashimoto's. I was diagnosed with that when I was 27. And so I went for a couple of years, and, um, and in about 2003, 2004, I started having other symptoms. Um, oh, even before that, I had dry eyes and dry mouth, but I thought, oh, well, you know, I at that point I was living in California, and it's very dry where I was living in San Diego. And I had joint pain, and I mean, I had to take a day off of work because I hurt so much. And so when I went back to my primary, he said, I'm going to refer you to a rheumatologist. So he did, and I was referred to a rheumatologist, and she gave me a diagnosis after a big workup of rheumatoid arthritis. And so I thought, oh, okay, well, that's, that's a heavy one. <laughs> and a couple years later, I did work in healthcare, I looked down at my hands and I said, I don't have rheumatoid arthritis. So I started talking to, I was working in a health, big healthcare system at that time, and so I started talking to people that, you know, I thought would know something about this. And one of them said to me, well, I, I think who you ought to see is Dr. Robert Fox. And he is one of the leading, uh, I mean, I know this now, he's a leading physician in the Sjogren's uh, area. And he told me, he said, well, you don't have rheumatoid arthritis. You were right. He said, but you do have Sjogren's. And all of a sudden, all, everything came, everything made sense because I had had um, repeated sinus infections. I had the dry mouth. I had the dry eyes. Uh, I thought that was just Southern California. I mean, sometimes by the end of the day, my voice was so dry that I really uh, couldn't speak. So the general pathogenesis of Sjogren's disease is depicted um, in this slide. And as with most of our autoimmune diseases, it's a complex interplay of genetic susceptibility, um, which is multi-genetic, uh, in combination with hormonal factors and triggering agents, and many of the common triggering agents uh, our infections, but also environmental uh, antigens play a key role. The two main um, pathways that are involved in Sjogren's disease are that of the innate immune system, depicted primarily on the left-hand side of the slide, involving uh, interferon uh, pathway, as well as the bath april pathway. And the toll-like receptors, especially toll-like like receptor 7 is a key player in the pathogenesis of Sjogren's. On the adaptive immune uh, pathway side, more depicted on the right-hand um, side of the slide, um, key players include all the main players in the immune system, but particularly T cells, B cells, and ultimately further development um, and maturation of germinal centers uh, which are the producers of long-lived plasma cells resulting in the uh, key antibodies seen in Sjogren's. Not specific for Sjogren's, but key in the classification and helpful in diagnosis of SSA and SSB, or Rho and La antibody. This next slide shows the overall pathophysiology of actually SICA, or the dryness symptoms. And it highlights that not only does the immune system play a key role, but actually the nervous system as well. So the salivary glands are highly innervated uh, excretory organs. Um, and so neural innervation, primarily in the parasympathetic pathway, as well as in the autonomic pathway with fibers, plays a key role. 
But additionally, a, a, another immune player uh, at this stage is a, it, the lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate that is seen um, in Sjogren's uh, is characterized by cytotoxic T cells, cytokine, uh, various cytokines produced, and B cells that actually make antibodies that are directed at the acetylcholine receptor. So although not widely uh, available in clinical practice to order, but very important in understanding the pathogenesis are antibodies to the muscarinic um, uh, receptor that play a role. And this highlights how important some of the treatments that we do have for Sjogren's um, are, and that is the use of secretagogues, pilocarpine and civilamine, which provide the muscarinic stimulation uh, for Sjogren's, helping with symptoms, but they do not address the underlying immunological lesion. This next slide really highlights the key hallmark of Sjogren's, and that is the mononuclear cell uh, infiltration of salivary glands and other target tissues. As seen on the right, the main cells are lymphocytes. These lymphocytes are both T cells and B cells, and they both play a key role in the pathogenesis of Sjogren's. T cell to B cell ratio in general is about two to one, but as the disease becomes more chronic, there is a shift towards more B cell uh, dominant feature. These uh, foci uh, occur in clusters, which is helpful um, in the diagnosis of Sjogren's. However, also key players are the glandular elements of the salivary gland epithelial cells, which are now felt to be important players. These cells have actually been shown to be able to present antigen locally and also to act as a co-stimulation in the activation of the immune response. Next slide shows um, ultra salivary gland ultrasound which is becoming helpful at the bedside and also is being evaluated for inclusion in actual not only diagnosis but classification criteria as well. The upper left, you see a normal uh, ultrasound, very homogeneous uh, in quality with a clear posterior border. Uh, and this progresses from right and down to left to increasing changes and the key changes are these cystic changes that occur of hypoechoic areas. You also can see um, with progression that there is a loss in the posterior border or it becomes a lot more fuzzy. So Dr. Carsons now will uh, bring us up to date with the key features of diagnostic and classification criteria for Sjogren's. Thank you, Nancy. And as Dr. Carter on, uh, just mentioned, there are many uh, serological, uh, immunohistological, and clinical features of this uh, disorder. So how do we put all this together uh, to classify um, patients uh, either for identification and enrollment in clinical trials or to assist with uh, clinical uh, management? Uh, currently, there are two major uh, the classification uh, criteria uh, schemes uh, that are in common use uh, by clinicians and investigators worldwide. Uh, these include uh, the well-known 2002 American European uh, Classification Group uh, or AECG criteria and the newer 2016 ACR ULAR classification cl criteria uh, which was a collaborative work uh, between uh, investigators and experts, uh, both in uh, North America uh, and uh, Europe. As we can see from the top two lines uh, of the slide, the major difference is the removal of subjective dryness uh, criteria 
in the newer 2016 criteria, this recognizes the fact that symptoms of dryness only have a specificity of about 11% for Sjogren's disease. So now we're utilizing a weighted scoring system with objective findings only, such as the Shermer test and ocular staining, which Dr. Carter uh, mentioned. And in addition, measurement of salivary flow rate and importantly, the antibodies, uh, particularly Rho SSA and the biopsy where there has to be at least one 50 cell aggregate or focus that Dr. Carter showed uh, in order to meet this criteria. And the two most heavily weighted criteria are the serologies, the SSA and the biopsy. It's very important to note the box exclusion criteria at the bottom of the slide, because this essentially uh, repeats uh, the differential uh, diagnostic list that we reviewed earlier. Dryness from head and neck radiation, active hepatitis C infection, HIV infection, infiltration of the salivary glands by sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, graft versus host disease in transplant patients, and IgG4-related disease. Recently, our colleagues in Barcelona proposed a prognostic algorithm for the risk of Sjogren's patients to develop systemic or severe disease, including potential progression to lymphoma. And we can see that epidemiologic factors such as age, ethnicity, and gender uh, play a role but the better defined factors are histopathology and immunology and serology. So we can see on the right that having a very high focus score, IFS, GCs or germinal center formation as Dr. Carter mentioned, hypocomplementemia, the presence of cryoglobulinemia, or the little MIG, which stands for monoclonal immunoglobulin, all portend uh, higher risk and may be useful in stratifying uh, patients for careful observation and initiation of therapy. We are now going to discuss the hope of novel agents in the treatment of Sjogren's disease. So as a general principle in the overall management of Sjogren's disease, it's important that um, we establish uh, the key features um, for each individual patient, which as you've um, heard, can be quite diverse. So having a multidisciplinary team, uh, usually composing of uh, a rheumatologist who has experience in Sjogren's, um, an eye care professional, uh, and a dentist or oral medicine specialist are often required for our initial diagnosis, appropriate diagnosis, and for optimal care. Patients should undergo a thorough pretreatment evaluation to determine, as I mentioned, not only the severity of their disease, but the extent and organ involvement um, and characteristics of their particular phenotype. The approach to management generally depends on the severity of the symptoms for the patient and the response to initial therapeutic options. But some key features are all patients benefit from a non-pharmacologic and preventive intervention strategy, including patient education, regarding various self-care measures, benefits of smoking cessation, counseling regarding anti-inflammatory diet, and medication use um, that may be contributing to any of their symptoms. Routine preventive care and immunizations are of course important, and especially with one of the key antibodies being involved, 
SSA, antibody pregnancy counseling in appropriate patients is key. Second, patients with SICA manifestations should use topical moisture, um, moisturizers routinely for all of their uh, systems that are involved, ocular, oral, uh, skin, and other symptoms of their dryness. In addition to monitoring their condition and the usual medication and dental preventive cares are, are key to uh, assure that your patients have access to and are being able to do. And finally, patients with moderate to severe Sjogren's, including the extraglandular involvement, may also benefit from systemic therapies, including the use of immunosuppressives or biologics that we'll be focusing on in the final part of the presentation. Now we're gonna hear uh, again from our patient, Mary Lou, as she discusses uh, some of the key symptoms that she experienced as um, in affecting her quality of being able to eat and having dry mouth and her overall dental care and topical therapies that uh, for her sicka symptoms that uh, are high maintenance and costly for the patient. I don't have any digestive issues per se, but I'm a very slow eater. And when I look back, that's old, you know, and I think part of it is because I, I probably was brewing this thing for years and I just didn't have enough saliva. You know, I was always the last one to finish no matter who I was eating with. I'd always say to people, I'm a very slow eater, so be patient. I also drink a lot of fluid um, when, when um, I'm eating. I've had a lot more tooth decay and um, had to have um, a couple of implants. In fact, I'm, I'm due to get one right now. I already have the, um, I had the extraction and, and bone, um, I guess they call it a bone implant. I have my teeth cleaned at least three times a year now. And, um, you know, I do, I, I, we have mineral paste that we use all of us, I think a lot of people who have this. We also um, do a lot of uh, mouthwashes. You can't use the stronger ones because they burn. Um, so dental is, is often a very big uh, cost. And I use probably, I use a lot of eye drops too. And I always buy the um, ones without the preservative. So there's a lot of, you know, sort of um, support items to keep some of the symptoms down. What's been key in development of new therapies for Sjogren's is the development of validated outcome measures. And this is one of the key um, outcome measures that is being utilized in clinical trials. It is the ular sjogren Syndrome Disease Activity Index, or SDI for short, that was developed by our French colleagues. And we wanted to highlight some of the key features of this outcome measure, as you'll be hearing more about this in some of the subsequent studies that will be described. So the measures, this measures disease activity um, and can be shown to uh, be sensitive enough to pick up improvement in disease activity, which is important uh, in clinical trial um, understanding. This measurement involves 12 domains, glandular, constitutional, lymph lymphoadenopathy uh, domain, joint, skin, respiratory, renal, muscular, the peripheral nervous system, the central nervous system, hematologic, and biologic domains. But I wanted to point out that at the time of this uh, instrument development in 2015, uh, it didn't include gastrointestinal domains or GYN domains. 
which can be important uh, for patients. The final score is a sum of all the domain scores. And the score rates, the score rates only active manifestations, so not damage features. So that's one of the um, lacking features overall in the uh, outcome measure. The score interpretation in general um, is as follows. No activity would be an SDI score of zero, low activity anything less than five, moderate activity ranges from five to 13, and high activity greater than 14. Minimally clinically important improvement for most of the studies to date is defined as an improvement in SDI score of greater than or equal to three points. And we wanted to share for the audience that an opportunity to learn more about this instrument, both for understanding the various manifestations of Sjogren's, as well as considering if you wanted to participate in a clinical trial, is a training exercise that's available um, at the Sjogren's Foundation website, and the link um, is provided for you at the bottom. Dr. Carsons will get us started on a much more targeted view of the immune system that sets the stage for understanding of the clinical, exciting clinical trials. Well, thank you. And uh, as Dr. Carter mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, there were several ways uh, in which the immune system uh, has been identified as being involved in the pathogenesis uh, of this disorder. And uh, this slide contains a lot of information, uh, but will be included in the practice aid that's available to you as part of this uh, program. Uh, but to start at the top of the slide, uh, we know that the innate uh, immune system uh, is involved and there are agents being developed uh, to block uh, type one interferon uh, as well as uh, certain co-stimulatory molecules. And there has been uh, ongoing attention on the lower right to uh, the T cell uh, arm uh, and T cell cytokines, uh, such as uh, interleukin-12, as well as T and B cell interactions, uh, which we will uh, go into a little bit of detail uh, later on. But a lot of attention over the past several years uh, has turned uh, to the B cell. So it would be reasonable uh, to believe that B cells would be targets for Sjogren's therapy. And although focal lymphocytic sialadenitis is a T cell predominant lesion, B cells, as shown in the photomicrograph, are plentiful in certain regions of minor salivary gland biopsies where they're associated with germinal centers and correlate with focus scores and disease activities. They, of course, are the source of Rowan-La antibodies and B cell CD40 enables engagement with T cells to promote class switching and high affinity antibodies the rowan lie antibodies have been clinically associated with certain extraglandular manifestations, including vasculitis. And of course, the one thing we want to prevent and treat associated with Sjogren's is lymphomas, which are overwhelmingly B cell derived, a marginal zone in lymph nodes and mucosal associated tissue uh, in epithelia. So it would be logical uh, to examine rituximab for its use in Sjogren's disease. Uh, unfortunately, at first, the pivotal phase three TIRS trial, as shown in the table on the left, did not show improvement uh, over placebo. Uh, however, a post hoc analysis of TIRS data using a more responsive uh, outcome measure, the Sjogren syndrome response index, or SSRI, did show improvement that was statistically significant at the P less than O1 level. Furthermore, a sub-study of the Tractus rituximab study conducted through the University of Birmingham in England uh, showed a reduction in salivary gland uh, ultrasound score 
indicating an overall improvement with rituximab. Using this data, the Sjogren Syndrome Clinical Practice Guidelines Committee issued the following recommendations guiding the use of rituximab in Sjogren's disease. And the two recommendations displayed uh, showed that rituximab was suggested for use for very severe uh, dry mouth uh, with uh, some evidence of residual salivary production and significant evidence of oral damage. Furthermore, the committee recommended uh, that rituximab would be appropriate for systemic symptoms uh, for the list shown on the slide, including cryoglobulinemia uh, with vasculitis, severe parotid swelling, uh, and inflammatory arthritis. So in extending the focus on B cells, uh, we can look back to an older study uh, looking at uh, belumimab uh, in Sjogren's syndrome. Uh, early on, uh, phase two showed uh, involving 30 patients, uh, a 30%, um, the outcome measure was a 30% improvement in two of five components, dryness, pain, fatigue, global systemic uh, visual analog scale, and any B cell activator marker. And 60% of patients achieved the primary outcome. So this slide shows a more recent combination trial using uh, sub-Q belumimab plus uh, rituximab um, IV. Uh, the four uh, groups in this randomized uh, control trial were placebo, belumimab plus rituximab, belumimab alone, and rituximab alone. Uh, the square on the left um, in blue showing the combination uh, shows uh, a marked improvement um, in reduction in the STI uh, disease activity of the combination uh, compared to uh, placebo lung and individual agents. There are actually also, um, you see to the right, was improvement uh, with the combination uh, in salivary flow. And very importantly, there was no significant increased signal for safety, particularly infection, uh, in any of the groups in this combination trial. This next slide uh, focuses in on uh, the co-stimulatory pathway that's a key in lymphocyte uh, activation. And this uh, co-stimulation uh, pathways, of which there are several, are key in the features uh, in the box to the right. So see cell proliferation, survival, antibody class switching, and importantly, an antibody affinity maturation. Uh, and we wanted to highlight uh, one particular uh, pathway, uh, the CD4 and CD4 ligand uh, pathway. So Dr. Carsons will now uh, describe further development uh, in uh, this pathway. Thanks, Nancy. And we're going to talk about development of anti-CD40, this co-stimulatory molecule, uh, through development of a biologic called escalimab uh, for use uh, in Sjogren's disease. Initially, a phase 2A randomized trial involving 44 people examined two doses, uh, 3 milligrams subcutaneously or 10 milligrams per kilogram intravenously for 12 weeks, with a subsequent crossover to a 12-week open-label extension. The primary outcome measure was a change in STI at 12 weeks, and the IV cohort revealed a change in STI of 5.64. In addition, a reduction in the chemokine CXCL13, important in germinal center formation, was observed. And there was one adverse event, a bacterial uh, conjunctivitis in the low-dose cohort and no thromboembolic uh, event. Uh, this slide depicts uh, some of the outcome measures 
uh, showing uh, the S die change on the bottom of the slide at uh, a minus uh, 5.6, and also significant changes in physician and patient visual analog uh, scales and measures of fatigue. This um, graph uh, shows the uh, crossover data showing a maintenance uh, of improvement uh, as uh, indicated uh, by the bottom curve uh, on uh, both the escalamab uh, three mg per kilogram subcutaneous on top panel and the 10 milligram per kilogram IV at the bottom panel. Further development of B cell agents is highlighted uh, by studies on ionalumab, an antibody to the BAF receptor uh, for the treatment of uh, Sjogren's disease. Uh, and uh, this study uh, showed that the primary endpoint was met with a statistically significant uh, dose response curve for improvement uh, in SDI, uh, along with positive changes in the physician's uh, global assessment and a numerical trend for improvement uh, for stimulated salivary flow. This slide uh, shows data from the phase 2b uh, dose finding trial, where both the estimated SDI dose response in A the SDI score change over time in panel B, and the physician's global assessment score change over time in panel C, uh, all demonstrated improvement with ionalumab over placebo. And uh, further studies showed improvement in stimulated salivary flow uh, over time, uh, changes in the SPRE, the patient uh, reported scales uh, over time and uh, the distribution of low, moderate, uh, and high uh, SDI activity response uh, versus uh, placebo. Dr. Carter will now describe a novel uh, approach to treatment of Sjogren's disease. Thank you, Steve. Um, this is a uh, agent um, that uh, is a RNA uh, enzyme that degrades RNA that's attached to an SC fusion protein to prolong. And, and we've heard in this program uh, the importance of uh, ribonuclear protein antibodies uh, in Sjogren's disease, the SSA and SSB. Uh, so this particular agent uh, is intended to degrade uh, those complexes. We also know that for Sjogren's patients, one of the key features that affects their quality of life is fatigue. So this uh, development program uh, is looking at this novel agent, RSLV132, uh, with an outcome measure of fatigue. And the outcome measures for this trial were actually four independent validated measures for fatigue. So basically, uh, the agent uh, achieved uh, their primary endpoint uh, for the trial across those uh, outcome measures, uh, and we'll be moving into uh, phase three trials uh, shortly. The next slide um, just is a list of all the current um, listed clinical trials uh, for Sjogren's disease using, um, as we've described, very targeted novel agents uh, in the immunopathogenesis pathways. They're grouped by uh, targets. Uh, many of them are in phase two, a couple in um, phase three. Uh, with their uh, endpoint targets. There are a total of uh, 16 trials that are currently listed, uh, looking at 12 uh, novel uh, invest investigational agents. So I think it's an exciting time uh, for Sjogren's. And Dr. Carson's will close us out um, with some the summary and some take-on points 
um, that we would like to leave you with for this educational program. Steve? Thanks, Nancy. Uh, so we've tried to cover uh, items uh, regarding patient and physician uh, education and uh, the fact that that effort has improved time to diagnosis, but it can still take uh, too long a time. Sjogren's has a high disease burden and cost. And in addition to dry eyes and mouth, there is a range of extra glandular manifestations, including progression to lymphoma that still can occur. Uh, there is a value uh, to well-coordinated multi-specialty teams uh, and efforts toward disease prevention. Lymphocytic infiltration of epithelial tissue is the hallmark of the disease to which T cells, B cells, cytokines, and epithelial cell activation all contribute to pathogenesis. And as we hope we just showed, there is uh, exceptional promise to the emergence of therapeutic development in the area of Sjogren's disease. This activity is certified by Penn State College of Medicine. This activity is developed in collaboration with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the slides and practice aids. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash HPW 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Novartis Pharmaceuticals Corporation.